Welcome everybody to our 67th webinar of our series here in 2020. Uh, been uh, been blessed to have some great some great guests, some great technical um, uh, versions of our webinars where we talk about how to run the software and how to do data analysis and how to driver coach. And lately, we've been talking to a lot of folks that are either engineers or authors or you know experts in the field and have been around a while that uh, just have some great knowledge to share. And, and boy, are we going to take that to a new level today with our guest, Jeff Braun. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Thank you for doing this with us. Hey, thanks for having me, Roger. I really appreciate it, and um, I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, it's always fun to talk uh, talk racing. The only thing better is to actually be racing, and that's <laughs> difficult nowadays. So I'm really excited to be here. But you did just come from the, the 12 hours of Sebring, so and we'll chat about that in just a moment. So I know you are at least getting out and doing a little bit. So yep. We'll, we'll, yep. we'll chat about that in just a, in, in a little bit more in a sec. So um, the uh, let, let's talk about Jeff a little bit and uh, and get a little bit of background on Jeff. I'll, I'll go through a, just a couple little things here, and then Jeff, I'll ha I'll have you uh, maybe give us a little bit more background on some of what we have bulleted items up here. I've uh, I've known Jeff for quite a while, but we 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 would meet each other at the racetrack or see each other at the uh, you know different trade shows and, and some different things, and always enjoyed chatting with him as you know super smart guy, and uh, and then I did get to work with him a, a little bit closer at some global rallycross events and, uh, and and got to know him a little bit more there and uh, and had a, a really good time. It's uh, uh, it's fun to work with people that are that are uh, into this business, do a, a lot of uh, uh, interesting work, and are, are super successful. Uh, Jeff, give us the give us the the background. I mean, you, you you the first bullet here starts when you're age three, and then I think you're a little older than that now. So give, <laughs> <laughs> something happened in between all of that. Uh, uh, give yeah. us a little bit of background on you. Um, so yeah, I started um, I started racing go karts when I was um, seven or something like yeah. that, and um just uh just fell in love with it and um by the time i realized that you actually had to go have a job and make money i was like man maybe i could do that in racing somehow and that wasn't a st straight direct path but uh you know got my degree in mechanical engineering and um met a couple people and and, and actually it was data data systems were in their infancy and i knew through another job that I had and a lot of studying, I knew something about data acquisition systems and not many people did in the mid to late eighties. Yeah. And so um, I got a couple opportunities through Carol Smith, uh, who I had known and he needed some help with some data systems cause he was new to it as well. And um, that kind of kicked off my professional race engineering and just kept on working on it from there. Um, and you know 60 years later now from when i went to my first race here i am <laughs> okay that time i, I didn't want to throw that right. time it out there years. It, 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 years. It, yeah. scaling is everything right, <laughs> right. <laughs> 60 years right. Exactly. but in the middle of that the, uh, that third bullet there is impressive to anybody worldwide the uh, eight sports car championships two 24 hour of Daytona, eight Sebring 12 hour and four Petit Le Mans wins. That, yeah. uh, that, that is pretty impressive. And that was with a, just a whole bunch of, not a bunch, but a, a variety of, of uh, different kinds of cars and teams. Uh, pretty Absolutely. impressive, pretty impressive. Well, thank, thank you. It's always uh, good when you get to work with good people, good drivers, good teams. And so I've been, been real fortunate and um, you know, it's, it's, we've had some good successes and uh it's the ma main thing is 60 years later it's still as much fun as it was when i was three so and, and challenging I, I suppose right and uh, yes yes it's a different set of circumstances a different set of uh challenges but uh the challenges never go away no matter what car you're in whether it's a you know a, a, a track day car or a dpi at uh sebring it's it's still challenging and that's what makes it fun and it's and the, you know you have that uh, that piece that of course makes this whole thing worthwhile, which is you've got thirty five or fifty other cars and and people that are just as dedicated to going faster than the than the next guy, which makes it never ending and a never ending challenge. So exactly, exactly, yep. <laughs> In 1995, and kind of the hook that we uh, that we're kind of tying, uh, you know, some of these fellas together with, it, whether it be you know Buddy Fay or Bob Knox or Chris Chris Brown from the last few weeks with with books, is Jeff Jeff did write a book in, in 1995 along with uh, a friend of his and fellow engineer Paul Haney, and uh, Inside Racing Technology, and that um, that that book is is I st I still open it up and look at it. I I'm a 
I love to look and, and read it. And last night I, I cracked open the book and there is a chapter on data, data acquisition. I mean, the thing was written in 1995. So some of it is obviously dated, but, but the um, computers and racing and data acquisition chapter in that uh, it w was interesting. It, w it was fascinating to me. And, and some of the stuff that is just was so true then and is so true now just with a different level of tool. And um, uh, and uh, I remember that one of the things that stru struck me was uh, was you, a story you told of, of working with your dad when you were a, when you were a kid and started talking about maybe some uh, some new stuff that was coming up as far as uh, hardware and he says the only the only data acquisition tool I need is a stopwatch and uh, and and you know I, I uh, obviously we're all data guys and and there is more to that but uh, but uh, we have what we around here call the money channels when you know lap times and speed right, it, right. It, at the end right. of it all it, that lap time and your finished position on the track you know based on your speed is is, is the bottom line. The rest of it is all about what happened and where did it happen, right? Right. And why, and and the bigger part of why, so you can fix it and engineer it and make it better. So I, I really enjoyed the book. We'll, we'll chat a little bit, I think, also today about the suspension chapter. I, I thought maybe a perfect time would be you coming in and chatting about just some basic suspension stuff. We're not going to talk mm -hmm. data on it, but shocks and you know, what 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 some of these basics. I think that will be interesting for so, for some of our folks to hear from a from a, a race engineer that's been doing this for a long time. So, yep. uh, perfect. We'll we'll chat about some of that. Let's go back just a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll slide to this next slide just so everybody can get a good look of what the, <clears throat> what the what that book looks like, and it's I don't we don't believe it's available new at this point, but uh, certainly there are some uh, used used products out there. If you did a little search on eBay or or somewhere, you probably could find it. I again, I really I really enjoyed it. it's 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 to me it's even good reading. There's uh there's some it, it's not just technical, but it's good reading. The, the, I, I think Paul, you, you how did that book get started? By the way, just just so since we're chatting about it, Paul wrote it for the most part. You were uh, given yep. a lot of technical uh, information about it. How how did uh, how did it yeah. come together? Why did he write a book? Uh, it was weird. Back um, pre-internet, or yeah, I guess pre-internet, Paul wrote a little newsletter called TV Motorsports, I think it was. And it, it, it was just a listing of all the auto racing shows on TV that month and what time and channel so people could get it. It seems kind of weird that you need that now, but back then you needed that. And, and I was a subscriber, by the way. I guess it's just oh, <laughs> kind of interesting, small world. Well, <laughs> And Paul being an engineer, not actually in racing, but an engineer who was uh, very interested in racing and everything, he, he wanted some technical content to put in his little newsletter. And so we talked and um, he would add some things and we would do different topics in this newsletter. And after two or three years of them, there was a bunch of topics and a bunch of little articles on, on all technical things. Paul bound them all together one day and went to Kinko's or whatever and spiral bind 50 of them and gave them out to friends, you know, just, hey, here's a collection of all of these. And about a year later, he gets a call from Motor Books in Wisconsin who publish all the auto racing books. And, and they said, hey, Mr. Haney, we're in receipt of your manuscript for your book. And he's like, book, uh, book. And he goes, yeah, your TV, motorsports, technical topics. He goes, oh yeah, our book. Right, right, right. You know, he never <laughs> intended it to be a book. And then he called me up and said, hey, Jeff, we got to turn this into a book. I said, I said, I'm race engineering. You got to turn it into a book. I'll help how I can. And he said, well, how are we going to split the fees and stuff? I said, whatever you do, all the work, you keep all the money. I'll just, you know, now I talked to Carol Smith about it. I thought, well, here's a guy who knows about books and Carol doing, was, yeah. yeah, he's kind of my mentor and helping me out and, and, and things. And I said, Carol, what about this book? He said, look, let Paul do all the work. You don't take a thing. It'll be a great business card for you. And so I, I always thought of it as a business card and, and now it's old. It was scary when it first came out. Cause it's like, Oh, I put all this stuff down and people are going to be able to read it and pick it apart and find out all the <laughs> things I said that are wrong. So it's out there. It's a lot. It's pretty old now, but uh, there are some pretty good, pretty good articles. And I think really the shock for everybody listening, the shock segment is actually still pretty good. Uh, you know, what, none of the none of the physics change. Newton was pretty right. And, you know, all of that's pretty much good. There's some new modern versions of shocks that are available now that aren't in that book, but Still, it's it's a pretty good basic uh, understanding of that, and 
and like you say, some good stories in there also from yeah, back in the day. The way that uh, the, the way that Paul put it together, it, it, there are there are technical facts, then there are stories, then there are interviews with with people in the industry. Uh, there was some interviews with Mario Andretti about data, and and and, and on and on, right? So it, it's mm -hmm. it's put together in a way that's uh, not just technical and interesting to read on the technical side, but uh, you know, cool stories and, and and fun stuff to boot. So if you if, cool. if you can find a copy of it out there, uh, the, the, now you know the back story that it wasn't even meant to be a book it was <laughs> no. it was a hundred percent on accident that and that yep. is uh, that is to me is just amazing so yeah. um so so anyway the um uh what i'd like to do now for those watching I, i'm going to uh, i'm going to stop sharing the screen so because uh, we're just going to chat now with with jeff about some different things and, and well let's see if we can um let's see if we can make our, our uh, jeff be a little bit bigger for all of you guys to see that might be fun the um uh, you do have some choices on your uh, on your zoom uh, in the upper right corner to typically i think it's the upper right corner to change make it full screen to change uh, panel view speaker view some other things play with that on your end if uh, if if it'd be if it works for you better, um, let, let's chat about a couple of things. The um, the the first one, it, uh, I'd like to just start off with a with a question from the Q and A box. Um, is the story about you sending Colin out in the dark on the home track at lights with no light with no lights on? Is that true? That's absolutely true. The track is. <laughs> I'm sitting literally right 100 yards from the front straightaway of that racetrack right now. It's right out the door here um at home and it's um yeah so we have a go-kart track we built at home it's a paved third mile uh 15 foot wide asphalt road course and uh we built that because i was away racing cars on the weekends and we had we couldn't go practice karting because the kart track closest one was in dallas which was you know 200 miles away so we built this track and and, and it's West Texas by you know, 100 <laughs> degrees in the, in the summer and it cools down at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. and that's it dark. So we're like, yeah, we'll get some lights and that didn't work too good, cars pointing and stuff. And we just said, just go run in, at night in the dark. So we'd fire up the cart, he'd go run. It would be pretty dark depending on the moon and lap after lap after lap two, three in the morning, no problem. You'd just be out there running, running lap, burning tires and, and um, getting better. Yeah, getting better. And, yeah. and, you know, then, you know, now certainly dark places like Sebring, he just got back from the 24 hour at spa. He ran last couple of weeks ago and he loves running at night to him. It's like, man, who needs headlights? <laughs> yeah. You had, you, you mentioned you have a, uh, Two sons. Colin obviously is a very successful professional driver uh, on his own and out uh, and out doing so uh, all sorts of things. What does your other son do? It's a pretty interesting story there as well. Yeah, so Travis is 16 months younger, and he's a creator and writer um, in Hollywood. For he's working for Disney right now. He has two television shows currently um, airing on Disney. One of them in its third season. The other one just starting. And so he created these TV shows and he's the head writer and basically runs to um, television, current television shows. He's got a couple of movies in development and production right now. So he's the, he can actually spell, punctuate, <laughs> capitalize, unlike me, he, he can do all of that. Stuff. It skipped, it skipped you and went right to him on that, on yeah, the, on that skill, right? Yeah, definitely can't do any of that. <laughs> and kind of funny though, that uh, six months a year ago, we have, uh, we have some grandkids now and they were over and we were watching some stuff and the closing credits were rolling past and, and there was, uh, was Travis's name. So <laughs> that's cool. uh, seen it as well. So yep, uh, that's cool. Congrat congratulations on, uh, on both of their successes. Thanks. The um, uh, another story, another question up there before we get going, David Arkin, who is a racer in uh, nearly in that class, who is the builder of the, the Gemini GSXR one liter engines for the, for the level five Scott Tucker program? <laughs> So those are all built in house. Oh, really? Um, really? Yep, yep. We did that. Um, we did that in house with our engine company, and well, with Level Five's engine facility. And we bought basically when that program started, we bought one of every GSX star that was available for the youth sports racer, uh, like four or five engine builders, and we took them all apart and decided, yeah, we didn't really want to do an atmospheric engine. So we did a um, turbo, 0.67 liter turbo, which was legal at the time. 
and went from like a good motor at that time atmospheric engine was making 200 horsepower and we made well over 300 with the turbo out of 0.67 liters so, so yeah it was them. all done so did them in in house. That's a that, yep. that's that's another amazing fact. That yep. we're not going to get deep into that story. You've done some uh, some pretty interesting podcasts. Uh, I think with, was it dinners with racers, where you yep. talked about that program a lot. And uh, yes. and I'm not sure if Robbie, our link master in the chat, I should have I, I should have thought about mm -hmm. that, Robbie. Sorry. If you could dinners with racers and and Jeff did a, a podcast on there. Maybe you can find it and link it to, before we before we end here. That that whole series number one is great. And number two, that particular story of that uh, that record. <laughs> operation of building a car just to dominate that class and to win the runoffs was a was a was a very uh, very cool story so, that was a great great project uh, a kind of a rare no rules kind of situation <laughs> and so we could go, we went nuts uh, there you go. Look at it. Matt. Uh, Matt found it already. There it is, uh, fellas. Uh, when you get a chance, uh, go go watch that episode. That is a very very interesting. So, um, the uh, so now you've you've you 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 raced carts. I talked about your dad and you know talking about uh, the stopwatch. The, mm -hmm. Then you got up into racing cars. What, kind of an interesting tie. Um, some of your first races, one of uh, you, you met a, a fellow by the name of Buddy Fay, who was our was our previous guest, uh, racing As, uh, racing cars. So yep, absolutely. I was um, I just turned so I started racing cars when I was 16. You could race in Canada when you were 16. You had to be 18 to race in the U.S. So I did a couple of years in Canada, living in Wisconsin. It was an easy trip into Toronto, Mossport, Sancho Vite, which is you know Mont Tremblant now, and some places like that. Tracks, some fantastic tracks. Yes, yes. So I got to do that, then came to the U.S. And, and we did a race in Kansas, and I raced against this guy who had, uh, was really quick, and he was older than me. I don't know how much older Buddy is, you might want, want to say, but he was, uh, I was a kid, and he was not, and um, and we had a, we were in the same class, and he had his MG Midget, I had my Triumph Spitfire, and I think... Um, I, I think if I would have beat him, I'd remember that. So he probably beat me. But anyway, we started talking after that and he was a cool guy. And that, that kind of, we went our separate ways and I hadn't seen him for a long time. And then, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, I saw him at the racetrack and I'm like, buddy Faye, you're the guy who I raced. And he goes, you're Jeff. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we reconnected 15 years later as engineers. Um, both, I will say that I, turned out to be engineer because I didn't have enough talent to drive well enough. I don't know what Buddy's thing is. He probably chose it because he had the option to do either one, but not me. So we both ended up engineers and um, are good friends to this day. How, how uh, interesting story that, and and uh, and and by the way, in the book, it even mentions in the data chapter. Go go look at Buddy Faye's book for more detail and and more uh, expertise on the data analysis part. So, uh, kind kind of an interesting tie that. Uh, that you, yep. yep, exactly. The um, you became a race engineer and uh, and and did your own data work. I know for a while, and and now you have data. You you still understand how to read it and everything, but it's coming at you. How important do you think it is for a a, a race engineer or a data person to uh, to have some some background in the seat to, to have raced to have that feel and that knowledge of what <clears throat> what is happening inside the car I think it's really important and, and, and even if you're an engineer that doesn't have um, doesn't have a car that can go you know that you're super into driving just to go work with somebody where you can go drive you know do a chump car race uh, champ car i guess they call it now or one of yeah. those lemons races or whatever the, the those endurance races are you know you can find a buddy and chip in your quarter or fifth for your five driver lineup which won't cost much and go run and experience that because you really need to understand what your drivers are going through what they're dealing with the workload those kind of things because when it gets right down to it for me, the data is really what you're trying to do is change the car to do what the driver expects it to do. Because you can have all the simulations in the world, which we have, and you can have all the seven post rigs and KNC rigs and wind tunnels and massive data systems. And, but if, if the car doesn't behave the way the driver expects it to behave, he can't extract the most out of it. And so that's really the race engineer's goal. And if you don't understand on a kind of a base level what a driver is dealing with and what he means by 
under fear and what that really feels like. You, you're, you're not as well armed to go help them um, get the car to do what they need, need it to do. So I think it's super important. You don't have to go out and buy a car and do all a big thing. Just get with a buddy and go do some of these long, long races and drive for two hours and do that and understand that you'll be much better off, I think. There, there's a whole the whole mental part of being being a driver and then and, and the forces and the and the stress that comes along with that while you're trying to do this highly skilled physical piece of driving the car and then the and uh, as well as you know just just trying to get you know, extract the, the maximum out of it and uh, as a I'm not a, a an engineer for the teams but I you know I do some data work and to me, uh, being able to know when I look at a, a lateral G sensor trace and to understand what it's doing when it takes that set, it would yep. be harder for me to, to look at a, a data trace and see some things in it if I didn't feel that. I think I could get there, but it's it would take, the, the learning curve is gonna be much longer. So I, I think there yep. is such good effect of having been a driver. And, and, and they, they're so related too there. I, and I'll, I'll take 30 seconds to tell a quick story here. I was working at Indy with uh, Delara, and they wanted to understand what we just talked about much better, uh, how the driver relates to things. And in the, uh, you need an understeering car or a, a neutral car is as loose as you want it to be. So you never want a loose car, you end up crashing. So we were trying to understand how the driver sensed that, how much understeer was too much. And this was back in, oof, 90s late 90s maybe and so this is pretty common now and i'm sure you have the sensors for it and all of that but we put a strain gauge sensor in the steering shaft to measure steering torque oh. so we had steering position and steering torque and we could now measure the actual what the driver was feeling in his arms and, and this is where driving a car gives you a feel. If you drive, you know what that feels like when it starts to understeer, the steering gets lighter. Right. And, and when it's oversteering, it gets heavier and you start turning this way. But we could now measure that torque. So we knew what the driver was feeling. We could measure the steering angle. And when we saw torque go down and angle go up, we knew we had understeer. Ah. If we saw torque go up and angle go down, we knew the fronts were gripping really good and we were about ready to get to neutral. <laughs> and so we could now quantify the driver's feel. Interesting. How neutral is it on a scale from one to 10? Well, it's a five. Look at the data, look at the torque, look at the angle. And we could say, oh, so that's a five for him. Okay. And now we could start to quantify what the driver was feeling. So it's important to, for the engineer to understand what that feel is and then relate that somehow like we did there with Delara to what the data is telling us. Interesting, as you're, as you're telling that story, of course, you know, everybody, my mind and, and I'm sure everybody else is going and, and feeling what they have feel, felt and seen. I, I, I didn't race a bunch of road racing pave. I did, I did off-road racing, you know, dune buggies and trucks and, you know, that kind of thing. And it was, and it's funny how we, in a desert race, you're, tra you're traversing many different types of terrain and you could actually feel it in the front tires and you, you were feeling the grip uh, through the steering wheel. And I hadn't ever put that two and two together with that, uh, you know, that indie story. The, 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 the thing that those screwed us up for a while, and we had no data back in the time that we were doing this, but we then went from manual steering to power steering. And mm -hmm. a lot of drivers had a lot of trouble controlling the cars at speed and, and catching them early enough to do what they do because all of a sudden that, that feedback, and then they had to really modify and they, 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 they built much better power steering systems nowadays where you still get that feedback, but yet it's, it's easier instead of totally exactly. num numbing it out where you didn't feel anything. And I know um, some forms of motorsports have added power steering, certainly in, in, in a lot of the classes, and I'm sure they had to go through that same thing. Yep, for sure, for sure. And, and, and now the electric power steerings are much more, uh, have a much better feel than the hydraulic systems. And you have, you know, the KYB systems, you can increase the torque or turn it down. And we even have it set up in the prototypes now where a driver has a preference and when he oh. plugs his driver ID and it knows who's in the car and automatically oh. switches the, the steering level to what they like and some other things. Yeah. To, All of these to, different to, settings to, that they happen to, 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 to personalize it to them. Interesting, yeah, very cool. Exactly.
Very cool. There, there could be uh, five or six questions on that one, right there alone, and how mm -hmm. you work data and engineering around that. But let me. <laughs> no, <laughs> but sure. um, when uh, uh, a while back you you raced, you started to do to do some um, engineering. When, when you first use data, give me a give me a background. You're you're out there working along, and then all of a sudden data comes into your life. Whether it was when you were a driver or when it, when you became an engineer. Uh, when did you first start using data and what was your take on 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 the value of that and how how did you fold that into your processes? Um, it, it really became, it was, I guess I knew, I had questions. How does this work? Why is this working? What's the suspension movement? What's the speed trace? I had those questions. Um, that I wanted to answer. And there really weren't commercially available data systems at the time. So um, I had gotten, uh, I graduated from college in 81, I guess, 82, 81. And I, I knew data systems were a thing, but you couldn't really get them for racing. And I wanted to be a race engineer professionally. There really weren't race engineers back then much yeah. either. They were crew chiefs you know, who had the tribal knowledge from years and years and years of what springs to run and what, how to do it. And so I had to figure out how to get into that sport. Anyway, short story is I took a job with a company in the oil field in Texas. And what they did was sent tools down wells that had been drilled to see if it was an oil well or a dry hole. And it was data acquisition, but in an oil well. And so I was the engineer on that and I had uh, Dresser Industries teach me data acquisition. I was just measuring oil wells instead of race car laps, but it yeah. was the same thing. Mm -hmm. Took that knowledge and after a year of doing that and competition data system came out with a commercially available system. It was a huge, massive brick thing with serial ports you plugged in, <laughs> but it was awesome. I mean, yeah. a real guy could buy it. You didn't have to be General Motors or you know, a Formula One team, you could, a real guy could buy it for, I don't know, a couple grand. And, uh, and I, uh, I got one of those and started working on it, learning about it. And a, that's when Carol Smith called me. Uh, I got to know Carol Smith. You know, he was like, um, he was like the, the, uh, I don't know, the God of race engineering. Yeah, and yeah. I had a couple, you know, I got up the courage one day to go say hi to him at the racetrack and, we got to be friends and he called me and had come to a racetrack and, and we used data uh, basics, you know, steering, throttle, speed, uh, brake pressure. And maybe that was a little advanced. Maybe we we'll probably didn't even have brake pressure at the time, but uh, I an RPM and Carol and I started trying to make the sports 2000 go faster. <laughs> and it, so it was, it was the questions that drove needing the data rather than the data. You know, I see a lot of people, oh, I got a data system, I'll go faster. Well, you have to, you have to, it has to answer questions that you need answered to make your car go faster. And that's kind of how I got, got into data. Yeah, we talk a lot about that here is, is really the data analysis <laughs> triangle, right? What happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? That, that really exactly. is where you're going. And whether exactly. or not you use uh, video cameras or you use you know, data or you, you, you that's your, your goal is to understand th those three things really in, in depth. How, how would you like to, everybody listening, how would you like to have been that, uh, that amateur racer that in a, in a Sports 2000 that has Carol Smith and Jeff Brown being your, <laughs> uh, working on your cars and in engineering on the side? You know, you, yeah, you better drive it right you be <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah pre pretty crazy you talked about the basic sensors the end is something we've asked a lot of the folks you know the, the speed rpm the, the the three driver inputs you know steering brake throttle maybe gear position um when uh if you were going to go out and work with a with a young guy you know these days and you know young carter or something and, and you had a had some data what of, of those what what do you hang on? What do you what do you work on the most if you don't have that huge big data system? Is it uh, speed? Obviously, is one of our money channels. Obviously, that tells you if you're getting faster or slower. But but uh, of the inputs, the driver inputs, wh which one do you feel is always the most important ones? Well, I'll, I'll order, go back. Right? Yeah, I'll go back to what my dad said. The stopwatch data <laughs> sensor yeah. is still the first. If you're yeah. quicker by a second than everybody, you probably have less work to do than if you're a <laughs> second slower than everybody. Yeah. So that'd be the first one. 
So lap time, that's a data channel. So lap time. Absolutely. Then speed, obviously, like you said, speed is important um, just because you can compare quickly where the big holes are because you can't analyze everything that you've done for a 20 minute practice session. You have to go, where am I okay? Okay, I'm okay in this corner. I'm okay in that corner. Wow, I'm really bad here. And that can be based off your driver coach or a lap you've done in the past or a good data lap from a, a competitor that's um, you know friendly or a teammate or something like that, but some way to compare. Could be from when you were there a month ago and you were on pole and now you're kind of uh, uh, mid pack for some reason, why are we there? So that gives you the good basic where to delve deeper. Then the next one, the next two most important for me would be throttle position and brake trace, okay. brake pressure. Okay. Throttle position is obviously, if your throttle position is flat all the way around a entire lap, that's the goal. Whenever it's not at 100%, there's something, quote, wrong, something that could be better. So you can look at that and there's, you can get into a lot of what's the right throttle trace, uh, exit of a corner is it good for a little throttle and then a plateau and then full throttle or should you go straight to full throttle you know uh, i'm of the belief that the guy who gets to full throttle first is better than the guy who gets to throttle first yeah. but that's a whole nother we could spend an hour on that the brake trace is super important in how you balance the car all of our cars have some amount of springing and movement and weight transfer and the driver is on corner entry from brake to apex is the primary pers uh, way that you're controlling that platform. You're controlling the roll, you're controlling the pitch, controlling the squat. And the brake trace is tells you exactly how you're controlling it. And especially for drivers, there's a lot to learn from the brake trace over good drivers who control the platform because their cars will handle better than people who aren't braking correctly. So a lot of times I'll say, you know, hey, car's not good to the apex. You can help me out more than I can help you because you got to do this with the brake and, and not pitch it so much and not turn it in so hard or, or whatever. And so the brake trace becomes really important from a driving standpoint and a and a engineering standpoint. And, and at the time of the event, right? That yes, I can I can maybe help you, but but during that stint that you're out there, you can help yourself a bit, right? A, a, a lot even, right? And I, I, I've looked at some data or you watch on TV and you watch these guys that are really good drivers and they are adjusting the car, maybe it may be from the NASCAR world, which I know you spent a little bit of time on high speed yep. global stuff, Indy car, yep. where they enter the corner, how they apex, all, all of those things, what they're really doing is just maximizing the car, right? Maximizing exactly. Speed. Exactly. And it, it becomes, it becomes super, it, 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 we're back to that driver working with the engineer again. You know, I can say, hey, I can go stiffer on the front springs to help that, that pitch where it gets pointy, but you're going to lose some grip in the middle of the corner. Do you want to change your style or are you okay with that? Is that a good trade-off? And that's what the engineer and the driver work on. And one answer is not necessarily right or wrong, but the driver understands what he's going to get if i help him in this area it's going to hurt you in this area he understanding go, that it's a balance right right and yeah. he might go perfect I, that's okay i'm okay with that <laughs> so so that's that's really those are the the big ones i would say um and then you get into what the specifics of what you're looking at you know if you if you have an aerodynamic car that's a super high downforce car and you're on the you have third springs and you're into packers and bump rubbers, then it becomes really important on how you, where you're engaging those and how much. So you need damper pots to see what your packer gaps are and things like that for a, for a high downforce car. Right. But, but that gets, those are less important. So for sure, speed, throttle, brake. And then next in my order would be steering. Steering is a, is a good thing for, telling you again what the driver is doing. And I don't know if this is, you may talk about this in a minute, but what goes along, what kind of blends all that together is a nice video embedded there. <clears throat> so you can actually kind of see it all together. You can see all the lines, you can kind of look at what's happening, but there's nothing like seeing a guy actually do that corner with his hands and maybe a in inlaid picture of what he's doing with his feet 
just to get the rhythm of it, kind of. Yeah, let's transition to that. But I, I, I want to take one step back and just tie, tidy it all together. You went right to throttle and brake pressure being your two, uh, even more important than steering to begin with. And yep. it was funny how you tied that together uh, earlier on, which was percent of full throttle was uh, something that was is critical. It, it is a it is a uh, an indicator of how comfortable the driver is with the car, how good the car is, and and you went right then to those two sensors. And throttle was how soon did you get to full throttle, not how soon did you get on the throttle, but full throttle, and then braking, which is the end of that full throttle pos you know, part of the trace. And right. it, to me, it it, it shows a, um, a, a a look into the your mindset of boy, you know, if uh, if we're on the throttle and they're not, we're going faster, right? And uh, so you get that number and brakes and throttle. Are the two pieces that are really driving that so kind uh, kind of interesting so and, uh, and, and uh, just one quick one the mm -hmm. shape of the brake trace from yeah. peak pressure to i'm not so worried about where you're putting the brake on so much it's what it looks like from peak pressure to zero okay. does it go drop or do you have this little you're balancing it and left foot breakers and right foot breakers have a completely different way of doing it but the shape of that trace is super important. So talk to, something I've talked really to really look at. I've talked to a lot of driver coaches during this and previous stuff and, and race engineers and they when they when you really pin them down, it's it, when they look at braking, it's not how you apply it, it's how you come off of it. And exactly. and, and, and it's uh, amazing that it's very, very consistent in the industry when I talk to people that know what they're doing or are successful. And it's all about, you know, boy, if you if you just have that brake pressure just drop off from a thousand PSI to zero, all of a sudden the platform, right? It, it just falls off the front tires. And, yep. and all of a sudden that loaded front tire has a uh, very little grip compared to what it did. And it shocks that tire into, into losing grip, right? So it's yeah, uh, right. Very, very, very cool. Yep. Very cool. Let, let's talk about video. You know, when you, um, uh, we had uh, Chris, Br Chris Brown in here a few, a few week, a week or so ago, and uh, and he talked about technology uh, in data and how it's used and how how it has been implemented. And a lot of it starts off at the pro level, and some of this technology shock pots or load cells or, or all these different things, but video was a different one and uh, that it actually kind of started at the amateur racer the guy that's out there having a good time working away and he, and he started to throw cameras into their cars and when, when pros didn't do that much and uh, and now the, the 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 video in the in the pro side is uh, is is a huge thing and continues to be in the amateur side uh, you started to chat about data and video and how that works uh, by the way the uh, you know we, we in the book here you talked about early on data when some of the organizations were trying to get a hold of it, they were they would allow you to test with it, but they would uh, they would force you to take it off for the races, and right. then and then there's some stories here you don't need to go recount into those about times you were putting vi video in the car and then watching certain you would build some contraptions, and uh, and trying to keep up with another previous guest of ours, the uh, Tommy Kindle in the in the Berettas, who had a had a lot of data work and and uh, and I think you even went on to say in the book here that uh, maybe they weren't taking it out of the cars all the time or something if I remember right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, uh, talk about video and how that has helped you. You started to talk about driver's feet and and, and some different things. Chat a little right. bit about video and how you use it today. I mean, we it, it's it's critical. You know, stuff's critical when when it doesn't work, you're unhappy. There so you go. There when you the go. data system doesn't work in my race cars, I'm like, oh. I mean, the video system. I'm like, oh man, we got no video. Are you kidding me? And, and, and suddenly you can't like live without it anymore. It's, it's like the water in your house when you turn the tap on, if it does, you just expect it. And so videos become that kind of a thing okay. on the pro, on the pro level. And today, you know, you know, even the IndyCar guys, the pro pro teams, uh, where they have two pro drivers are still use the video quite a bit because one of the things it does is it helps the engineer understand driver might say it's doing this particular thing in a corner and he's trying to describe it. You've, everybody's been there. They've either described it to another person or their friend or the, in their own mind, they've described it to themselves. Well, I turn in and then it kind of like the back kind of steps out and I got to kind of catch it. And then, and then it grabs and then I got to add more and then I have That's to add too much <laughs> and see the trace. You can see it right here on the data and you're all trying to get what's really happening and you just put the video up and you go oh i see and you see it in three seconds yeah. and so it it's maybe not going to point to 
how to what to fix to make it but everybody gets on the same page instantly and go okay i got that okay that's what we need to fix now we start to use the data traces to see what's really happening and what's causing that why does he have to do that right on the entry every time what's causing that is it a shock movement is it a is something that he's doing with his brake or the throttle or is it just too soft or what is it but now you understand the problem super well and, and so even that, even even better on the video is, is placement of the car that's one of the things that are, is hard to do in, in data so placement of the car is a, is a big piece of that exactly and and and, and so so even with pro drivers is important many many um professional series now have a pro amp component gtd and imsa lmp3 lmp2 all have a pro and an am driver many you know uh the michelin pilot challenge most places you go now have that pro and am component so for the amateur driver or the semi-pro like i like to call them the guy who's not being paid to do it but still pretty good yeah certainly. he's being coached by his pro the video is fantastic because a lot of the things like you'll say you'll talk about coaches will talk about clocking the car okay i'm in the right spot I, i'm in the same spot as you but you know, the, see if I can do this. You know, yeah. one car, they're, they're not pointed toward the pointed at a different one spot. One of them's exactly. clocked this way, and the other one's still going this way. The center of gravity of the cars are in the same physical spot in relation to the world, but one of them's clocked differently. You see that immediately in a video. You know, you turned in too late. That's why it's understeering now, because you asked way too much of the front of the car the too late into the corner. The video shows that immediately so yeah it's 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 really and, and then when you link the video to the data, data where you can scroll through it and you can see see this right here you lift it off the throttle look what you're look what you had to do in the video or, did, so or you had to do it because of this clocking thing right exactly there, there's there's cause and effect at that point right you can you exactly. can make it and it's a learning style for that driver you may have some pro drivers that uh, have lived on data their entire life can look at the squiggly line and say you know okay yeah i see what you're saying or another fellow that, uh, and he might even be a pro, but they need to see things maybe in a, in a slightly different way. So the video becomes important. Exactly. And it, the video, it just gets you there faster. You still need the data. All you're trying to do in this whole thing is answer a question. My car is doing this. I don't want it to do that. What do I do to make it not do that? Well, <laughs> and you have two hours between sessions. You don't have a week to go back and simulate it and do all that. So you look at the video. Now the engineer understands. Now you look at the data. I understand what he's doing. What could cause that? We're looking at the data to cause that. Okay, I think I know what's causing that. The rear is too soft. Now, do I go spring shocks, bars? What do I do to fix that? Or, but help, help, the has... or help the driver do something to help get around it as well, right? Because you're exactly. sharing a car. And so sometimes right. it's car driver. Hey, I can't go stiffer. If I go stiffer, it's going to be, we're at Sebring. It's going to bounce the thing off the, off the ground in turn 17. I'm sorry, driver, but you're going to have to balance it yourself in, you know, turn seven or whatever. And yeah, we're going to kill 80% of the track for you to solve a 10% section, right? It's not right. 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 But you have to do that quickly and you don't have all the time in the world. And the video just brings you to, to pinpoints you, focuses you in the area of, uh, of your extra work so much quicker. Interesting. The um, um, the you, you, you mentioned something that is uh, that I find I, I think is so important is is we can you, you talked about clocking of the car and and yeah you place the car at the right time and in data and in your engineering you're you're trying to resolve these what happened where it happened why did it happen and, and come up with a solution. I just want to touch into the rally cross stuff that, we, that where I've worked with you a little bit closer and nope. that running on the dirt becomes that clocking thing becomes so critical. Even those, those, even those cars being four wheel drive, you still had to rotate the car so much more early and your son was racing uh, along with the, the, the semi pro driver. And that had to be a learning curve for both of them to be to have to rotate the car so much more to be able to get the speed coming off the corners. What did you learn and, and uh, what are a couple of uh, interesting things about data in, in learning uh, on the dirt like that? Yeah, uh, it was, whew, that was big. Um, I learned that when normally in my uh, racing career, if 
all four wheel loads went to zero, you were in a world of hurt. And here I was like, yep, that happens every lap over the jump. Always. Okay, did this. <laughs> um, you know, and then, I mean, us, we had the sensor on the handbrake because as you mm -hmm. talked about clocking the car, the handbrake was important. How, when do you put it, that brake trace was now the handbrake trace. You know, what does it look like? Is he pulling it? Is he just squeezing it on and then pulling it a little more? You know, and, and then you would look at, try to look at the rotation of the car. Um, it was the data there, and here's the, probably a really good example. So I had been for many, many years, never done anything like this. I, I did top field drag racing, which was kind of as weird as, as the rally cross <laughs> thing for what I was normally into. And the data helped me out a bunch because I could, I needed to under, start to understand this quickly. You helped me out a bunch, but I needed, I needed to understand what's yeah. really happening here. And the data could help me with what's really happening. The video could help me with what's really happening. And, you know, it was completely different. We had, um, we had, you know, no grip on the dirt. We had jumps, we had <laughs> turning the car in weird ways. We had a track conditions that changed, changed lap to lap. I mean, the feature race, you know, all of this, the feature race was 12 laps. The heat races were six laps. And so races lasted, you know, the final heat, the, the final of the weekend Twice lasted more. 18 minutes or something yeah. like that. You know, that was the whole race. But the track <laughs> went from, from one condition to totally different because we were in a parking lot where they threw some dirt down and after two laps, the dirt was gone and it was an asphalt track. And then they put dirt back on for the next heat. So the data would let you look at how the driver changed things when the track changed and, and try to anticipate that. So but in the end, the, 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 the data and the engineering is following the same exact principles, whether or not exactly. you're there or on the drag strip, which I, I look forward to asking a couple of questions about the NHRA stuff. Uh, all of it all comes down to getting from point A to point B as fast as you can and beating everybody else, right? So all of that physics, all the technology, all the stuff you're trying to do, and let's just use the rallycross thing, it was all still about getting to full throttle, holding it down and, and being there longer than the, than the next guy. So interesting. Right. We used our, it was core, core autosport that I was on and we had run you know prototype cars and GT cars and we just employed the exact same processes and procedures exactly. and we, we analyzed data and just uh, because we didn't know how to do it any different and that had worked before and it was a race car on a racetrack like you said and so we just did the same thing. And I and I I, I am convinced and a hundred percent that that to, while we talk a little bit about road racing here or we you know we've done some dirt oval stuff, I've gotten a lot of feedback from a lot of people that it opens their eyes that data is data and that and the processes of following it and and getting to to what happened, where did it happen, why did it happen, and and make your changes on your car and try it again, is the same across all of these different types. So it's a, it's very very interesting. Absolutely. The uh, the data ver I'm sorry the uh, the NHRA thing that was a surprise to me when I actually uh, you know started to dig in a little bit here uh, a, a, a totally different method but again the same kind of a thing you want to get from z you know zero to the quarter mile point or now a thousand feet I suppose but but uh, as fast as you can mm -hmm. what are a couple of interesting things that you found uh, looking at some data and engineering a, a car in that world. Yeah, it, the, I was the technical director at uh, Team Scandia back in the uh, 90s, I guess it was that era, and and they bought a top fuel team. I'm not sure why. But, of course they did, right? <laughs> right, of course. We were, running, we were running sports cars, IRL, Champ Car, um, ARCA, and we needed a top fuel team, so we got oh, one. Of course. And... <laughs> And so we were starting to, there was this guy, Mike Clover, who was like, he was the crew chief on the car, still a current crew chief for Clay Milliken, probably one of the smartest guys I know in all the racing. And him and I hit it off and we started to look at, he was looking at what we were doing with the Indy car and the Pi systems on the Indy car and wanting to know more about his car. Again, to answer questions. It wasn't just, we need data. Why do you need data? I don't know. No, we, he had specific questions that he wanted to answer. I didn't even know you needed to ask those questions yeah, on a top yeah. fuel car, but he knew. So we started to instrument the car with the Pi system and try to do some things there. Went to the racetrack and learned a bunch about that car with the, with the data system. Um, strain gauges in the, in the frame rails. How does that frame flex when it, you know, 
the rear wheels basically try to drive under the front wheels and the frame does that as you're yeah, and we've seen some video of when that goes wrong yeah yep yep yikes for sure yikes they break the cars for in sure. half they have so much power if exactly. it's done wrong yeah yep yep so we looked at fuel flow rates and you know the clutch is super important super. and and they won't allow um like digital electronics they had oh, okay. they may now have been out of yeah, it for yeah, 10 exactly. years but yeah. but they had little timers and stuff to, to pull the clutch back at the right at the right time and uh you know dual magnetos and so there was a lot of things going on and boy the sampling rates were you had to do it fast because the whole race lasts three and a half seconds yeah cra so, crazy yeah so the sampling rates were real high and um had a great time learning a lot about data that's a real challenging area for data systems well there's a there, there's a, a huge difference there that, that's kind of what, what just to get your gut feeling on is you go from a a, a 12 hour 24 hour endurance type of a feel where boy the last three or four stops you're looking to milk every drop of fuel out of it because you want to cut one fuel stop and and and, and it's going to save you all this time and then you go to this top fuel car where fuel is a uh, uh, you're pouring it in like it's coming in on a funnel right what's uh what, what's the big difference there well yeah i i, I remember um one of the tv broadcasters once wanted to show how the what the flow rate of a of a top fuel car was and so i did some quick math of gallons per minute or whatever and we it turns out that if you turn like a your normal hose your garden hose on full blast and you measure that rate if you were to bundle 15 garden hoses you know and tie them with a you know with duct tape and turn them all on full blast that's essentially the flow rate of nitromethane into a top fuel car that's what it looks like and they're recording and that they're recording we were measuring that. that we were measuring that um and the thing is it's direct injected in a bunch of different spots it's injected into the supercharger directly into the cylinders, directly into the manifold. So there's all these injectors. There's like 40 injectors. And basically the top of the motor, you're just <clears throat> dumping as much fuel into the top of the motor as you can, as fast as you can. Because, you know, like on Sunday, if you're good, your whole race day lasts 16 seconds because you've done four rounds and that's it. So Amazing. happens fast. Wow. wow. And, 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 and when it goes wrong and the fuel gets in there and then the spark comes a little bit late or something, it, 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 catastrophic results, right? The motor's oh, yeah. in pieces. Amazing oh, yeah. stuff. Oh, Amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> a couple things as we kind of tidy this up, that, uh, there is, um, uh, there's a couple questions in the, in the box that I'd like to chat about. Uh, mm -hmm. Ray Phillips asks, Jeff, can you talk about technology that you have used to remote engineer Ferrari Challenge team that you support? Have you done some remote engineering? Yes, it's worked out really by, by force, I guess, because of yeah, the COVID thing. I, yeah. I was running a SRO GT3 Mercedes, AMG Mercedes at Road America for one team. And my Ferrari Challenge team had the race the same weekend at Coda. And so uh, Mike Watt, my Ferrari Challenge driver, was good enough to let me go run the SRO race but we figured out a way to do it remotely for the Ferrari challenge. Since there's not pit stops and things like that, I can yeah. kind of do that. So we, we, there's a, um, you're probably familiar with this and I know I'm pretty sure aim and I, and some others have some systems, but um, Jeff Siegel has a system called GPX, which is basically a, and I don't know how it works. You'll know this much better than me, but there's a, basically a cell transmitter, cell phone transmitter in the car that plugs into your camera. It calls up a Skype call. It dials my iPad in the pits and we see the video live wow. with almost no delay. I mean, wow. a tenth of a second, two tenths, maybe delay. So all the coaches in Friday Challenge use these. You'll go to a Friday Challenge race, you'll see every coach walking around with an iPad. And it's become much safer because you don't have to have a driver yeah. riding right seat yeah. and he can coach live on the radio, you know, okay, remember you're coming to this corner now, don't break so hard or whatever he's coaching him on. And you can see the live video. So me in road America, I had a, I logged into the Skype call and just watched the live video. Oh, interesting. The team 
racing radios has a deal where you can plug a little box into the into your radio and you plug your cell phone for a lightning connector into the other end of this box they make a call at coda they made a call to me on my cell phone i just use my cell phone on speaker with the mute button and when i unmuted I could talk and I would talk directly to the driver or the crew on the crew channel and I could hear race control. And when I unmuted, I would hear all the radio stuff. So I saw what the driver would see. I had direct radio communication. And then my data guy, we use like Google Docs or Excel and he puts in the lap times. So I'm watching that live. I can also type in notes from when the driver stops and he's telling me it's under steering here and there. I'm typing in my notes into this shared document. The tire uh, engineer is typing in to the same thing, the tire pressures as we're going. It was, <laughs> and I can Ama- see it amazing. all live amazing. right there. Amazing. It worked fantastic. It was, the- I, I got to thinking, do I really need to get on airplanes and travel to the racetrack? <laughs> This worked pretty darn good. Yeah, a whole new uh, meaning to inside racing technology, right? Right, there you go. <laughs> the, uh, uh, very, very, very cool. The, the uh, Matt asked a question, uh, do you find more, da- we're basically talking about data and the importance of engineering the car versus simulation. We only got a few more minutes left, but uh, you, we're doing more and more simulation all the time. I know that was actually a big part of uh, what I read in the book when you were hoping for something coming soon. And, yeah. uh, and obviously it's it's here, it's been here for quite some time. Uh, where do you use the data? What, what What's that percentage of uh, you know, si- simulation work that you do with data? So the simu- simulation has become very important. Um, 2018, when we ran our Orica at uh, CORE, we had a guy, Andrea Quintarelli, who did a ton of data work for us and uh, simulation work for us. And it, it, it goes hand to hand. It's kind of like the video goes with the data. You, one of them can't be out there by itself. What the, where kind of the process, the workflow there is You have to build a model. For any simulation to be good, you have to have a good model, a good, reliable computer model representation of your car. If it's not, then your data, then your simulation results are are no good. So it took us, Andrea worked probably for four months to build a reliable model before we got any value out of it. How do you build a model? You, You get the data, you, the actual data from a car on the track, then you run your simulation model and you compare the data outputs of both and if your simulation model doesn't match yeah so we keep working on this correlation 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 you know maybe you have good tire data maybe you have no tire data maybe you have good aero maps maybe you have none but you need to correlate your sim model to your actual data and that's where so now we talked about drivers and trying to understand what the drivers are doing with data. Here, it's pure engineering. Uh, it's, it's, here's what the data, here's what the car did. Here's what the SIM model did. They don't match. Why don't they match? Let's make the SIM model, tweak it here, tweak it there. So once you get, use the data to get the SIM model to be really good, then you can start to rely on the SIM model and run SIMs. And again, all it's doing, it's not telling us what to do, but it, for me as a race engineer, the simulation has reduced the number of things I need to try. Yeah. Understeering car. I know I'm going to Sebring. It's bumpy. It's da, 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 da. So I think I might have an understeering car. What am I going to do? I have eight things I can try. Well, the and you sim- know they're in the right direction, right? Exactly. I know, I know all of them would help, but I think, but what should I do? Let's run them all in the sim on a model that we really trust. And let's prioritize those. This one, God, probably not going to work, according to the sim. This one looks pretty good. This one looks pretty good. So now I have two or three choices to try for them rather than eight. So I'm more likely to get it right, right. and use the good one quickly. And so that's how the simulation and data work together. And you refine that model constantly. And, it, and simulation results become much better the longer you do it as you're making that correlation better and at the end of the year you get rid of that car you get a new one and you get to start over right <laughs> exactly exactly and that's, the, that's 
that's the tough, or they throw you a new tire. Hey, we're going to do a new tire. Yeah, we're going to change like, this tire that today, right? You know, right, right. Yeah. So uh, it's, and, it's important. It's and, and some of the models, some of the commercially available software is getting better. Andrea uh, Quintarelli, he wrote, wrote his own software because it wasn't good enough. Uh, and so we were, I was fortunate enough to be able to use his um you know expertise in that area yeah. but there's some pretty good commercially available ones and the prices are coming down i see simulation very much like data was in the late 80s where it was hard to get expensive and not really mainstream and that's where simulation was three or four years ago and it's starting to become pretty pretty available affordable and usable right exactly you have, you know, perfect inter interesting tie together uh, we are we are at the point where we're probably out of time we, we try to be as respectful as we can with uh, people's time especially yours I, I let me uh let me sh let me scare, share my screen back to uh, to kind of close this out maybe we'll uh, let's do this the uh, this of course is being recorded and we're uh, we're going to put it out there the you, you have said a lot of things that uh, that uh, uh, may have slipped by some of us uh, it'd be interesting to go back and rewatch it it's going to be out on YouTube here in just a couple of hours uh, all of you that are watching make sure you, you share it with other people that uh, let them know that this is out here share that link the uh, presentation I remember there was a question or a, a very early about the presentation the presentation was just a couple of slides but I will always make the presentation available to be downloaded in the in the YouTube description box just so everybody has that if you'd like so uh this will be out there very very shortly the um uh aim is is all about customer support we're, we're hopefully we'll see you we're uh, getting to the point where it's uh the, the season is starting to wind down make sure that you keep the number handy if uh if you're if you're interested uh, big race this weekend that uh you know some of us are always interested in. i'm an old off-road racer so the 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 granddaddy of mall the baja 1000 is this uh is on friday it starts tomorrow morning so that's uh, always a always a fun one wish we could be down there but uh travel is a bit of a problem the um the, uh, so give us a holler. Uh, a little bit about our, our next one is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, we've been talking with Jonathan about some different things and and uh, and Jeff touched on it a bunch today. And uh, so uh, finding more speed, if you're looking at some of your data in, in, in our AIM software, how do you tell? You, you just went uh, you know, three tenths quicker. Uh, yeah, you made some changes on the car. You made maybe you made some adjustments as a driver. Uh, Jonathan, who's a, a national you know, winning uh, race, race car driver is gonna come on and show us a little bit about how to pick. Was it the driver or was it the car? What, do I continue on this adjustment or do I, do I back up on this one? We're gonna do it around uh, tire, tire wear, different tire types to show that uh, you know, some of these differences, but uh, it, it works in, in all sorts of different things. So uh, join us uh, Tuesday, the 24th, uh, when, when Jonathan's gonna join us for our, his second time of co-hosting with us. So that'll be, a, that'll be a good time. A little bit of contact information uh, for, for Jeff and, uh, and myself, if you have any questions of, of this afterwards, Jeff has a, a little company that he uh, that he Mesa Vista Coffee, or um, uh, we put the link in the in the chat box a couple of times. Robbie may throw that up again, but Mesa Vista Coffee, where Jeff uses, of course, he's a he's an engineer, he's a data guy. He uses deep data technologies to to do some interesting things. Go visit the website, uh, take a look at what Jeff's doing. Um, Jeff, you can maybe say a little bit about that as you're kind of closing up. Uh, and uh, and do you have anything else you'd like to share as we kind of close this down? Yeah, I guess the first thing I'd like to share is, um, you know, you talked about customer support with AIM. That's, uh, you know, like I said, I've known you for a, a long time, but when we did that global rally cross thing, I was, um, I was data guy and engineer and uh, the data guys thing, part of it scared me more than anything. Cause I hadn't, I've had other people doing that for me and I, you know, I can, uh, but suddenly I had to do wires and sensors and GPS coordinates. And it was like, Roger, I need help. Yeah. Support is a big part of what we do here. Certainly. Right. And it was, that was fantastic. And, and then I thought, started thinking about AIM support, not to make this a commercial about AIM, but I did go, you know, we, I started using AIM data systems okay. with both mics, you know, of <laughs> AIM in carding back when Colin was whatever seven yeah, eight yeah, years old yeah. we used aim data systems throughout the whole thing so yeah. um yeah the best data system is one that's working reliable <laughs> and that you can use and that's simple that yeah. you you know because otherwise you don't get anything out of it so anyway yeah. thanks to everybody at aim and yeah the coffee thing is just a fun hobby i've got into roasting coffee and i do these small batches and and i have a temperature versus 
time graphs that I'm data logging <laughs> on each roast and trying to figure out. It's just like racing, you know, you're trying to make a car do something so that it's better for the driver while I'm trying to figure out what to do with the time and temperature profile of coffee to make it taste better or different. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just a hobby. But, it's true. Uh, it's, it's data logged and truly engineered coffee. So it's right. uh, yeah, go take a look at the website. I understand it's uh, it, it's pretty cool. Some some interesting things there. You'll see some ties to some motorsports side of thinking, right? So it'd be yep. kind of fun. Exactly. Per perfect. I, uh, I, I, I absolutely. I appreciate you coming. It's a it's a service to a lot of guys that are are, are learning different things. To have guys like you come on here and, and chat about your experiences and and some of the things you've done to be successful. It's a it, it's a real it's a real pleasure. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And uh, like I always say on these deals, the most important thing about it is uh, make sure you're having fun racing because it's, uh, it's a great way to spend a weekend uh, or a career. And uh, I'm very fortunate. Perfect. I appreciate that very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody uh, on, uh, on Tuesday to talk with Jonathan Goring about uh, more, more, data, more data stuff as well. So thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon and see you on Tuesday.